begin to tell you the number of times librarians have helped me with my work and archivists have helped me with my work. So I'm, I'm eternally thankful. So I was happy when, uh, when you called to, um, uh, reached out to me rather to, uh, to uh, offer this series. So thank you. Uh, I'm loading a PowerPoint, everybody, uh, if you can see it. And I'm trying to go to full screen. There we go. The fascinating lives of America's first ladies. Okay, so you can see the screen. So thanks to Rhonda. And I'd like to encourage everybody to uh, support the friends of the Sterling Road Library and support the library, support your local library. Um, and uh, also uh, during the Q&A, we'll have a Q&A, feel free to have at me. Uh, that's always the, my favorite part of all these programs. And um, uh, I'll defer to Rhonda on how we run the Q&A, but there is a chat feature at the bottom center of your screen. So you could simply text me a question or, or, or uh, or we can open it up. I'll defer to Rhonda at the end. So, okay, let's, let's get into this. So um, why write a book? I wrote a book on the First Ladies and then I uh, edited and, and, and directed an encyclopedia on it and a couple other projects. Um, so here's what, what I do. Every year, usually around the New Year's uh, and usually involving a drink, and I'm usually on a cruise. <laughs> and uh, some of my fellow passengers are actually on this uh, uh, Zoom chat. Uh, I sit down and I usually develop um, about five ideas for books. Uh, why five ideas? Uh, because invariably, um, several of the ideas won't work out. Uh, I'll, I'll have an idea and I think this is going to make a fantastic book. And then I'll read that David McCullough or John Meekham or Doris Kearns Goodwin or Ron Chernow is working on the same topic. So why even bother to write the book, right? Um, or I'll have an idea that I think would make a good book. But as I was talking to, saying to Rhonda earlier, a lot of times you have an idea, you think it'll make a great book, but I can't find enough primary source materials. That is original diaries, letters, uh, war reports, government documents. And if you can't get all that primary source information, you really can't tell the story in an accurate way. So I've had a lot of projects I thought would be great and I get partway in and I just can't find enough material. Or my literary agent or my publisher will say, it's not going to sell. <laughs> so we're not going to make money. So you're not writing it. And I say, okay. Um, so, uh, so I sit down and put together ideas. Well, several years ago, I was, uh, many years ago, actually, I should say, I guess this is 20. Uh, I sat down and uh, maybe over 20, I made a list of my five books that I wanted to write. And you're allowed to laugh when I say this, but one of the books was going to be on President James K. Polk. So you're free to laugh and say, what in the hell is wrong with Watson? Uh, who? Uh, who? Polk. He was a president in the 1840s, served one term. Actually, here's the deal. Uh, we have this whole string of presidents uh, from number eight, that's Martin Van Buren, up to number 15, which is James Buchanan. That whole string in there are some of the worst, not the worst, some of the worst presidents we've ever had. None of them served two terms. This is the era of Van Buren and Harrison and Tyler and Taylor and Larry Moe and Curley. <laughs> so we had some pretty bad presidents there. The one president that was pretty good was Polk. He's considered to be an above average president by scholars uh, who rank the presidents. Um, I have the great honor, great good fortune of being one of that fraternity of a uh, few historians that gathers every three years to rank the presidents. And they usually put Polk in that uh, like a B to B plus range, somewhere between about number 12 and number 15. I usually put him a little bit below that, but he's clearly an above average president. Uh, and his life was fascinating. He was the president during what was the Mexican War. Um, and he was the big Manifest Destiny guy. Uh, it was Polk who signed the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which gave the United States basically the Southwest, the entire Southwest. We took it from Mexico. Um, so, uh, and then after his presidency, after his one term, he could have easily had a second term. The only one in that string from number eight to number 15, who could have had a second term. Seven was um, uh, Andrew Jackson and 16 was Lincoln. So in between those two, who are pretty famous, you have these other presidents. Polk is so beloved that the country wants him to take a victory lap. 
people wanted to just see him. So he was going to cross, do a cross-country wave and meet and greet, if you will. He goes down to New Orleans, uh, just left the White House, boards a ship, and they start up the Mississippi River, and a disease breaks out on the ship, potentially yellow fever, and Polk dies just weeks after leaving the office. He was still a young man. Uh, so it made for, I thought, a pretty interesting book. No one knows him. Nobody wrote about him. So I was going to write a book. So I go and I start to dig up my work on Polk. Here's your long story short. I realized I didn't like Polk as a person, but I really liked his wife. <laughs> and I realized that I was writing about the wrong Polk. Um, so, for example, um, I was digging up some of his letters and his speeches. And his speeches were fascinating because what you see in all the, 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 you know, the margins uh, of the speech and on the side, there would be notes that would say things like this. Pause here for effect. Remove this from the speech. Read the article I clipped for you. Senator so-and-so won't like this. And I'm reading this saying, wow, Polk had one heck of a speech writer. So I matched the writing on the speech with guess who? Mrs. Polk. And you're looking at her there, Sarah Childress Polk. It turned out she was his editor, his speech writer, his advisor, his counselor, his confidant. Basically, she was Eleanor Roosevelt 100 years before Eleanor Roosevelt. And Eleanor's my favorite first lady, one of my heroes. So um, I thought, wow, Sarah, who knew Sarah Polk? So as I'm reading about Sarah Polk and doing my research, what I find was no one liked her. I liked her, but no one liked her. So I paused my research on Polk and pursued this question, why didn't anybody like Sarah Polk? Here's what I found. Because she was Eleanor Roosevelt, she was a, a feminist, a political dynamo, and a, a co-president in the 1840s. For example, it was common when the Polks went to social events, here was the standing joke. They would say, ladies and gentlemen, the president and Mr. Polk. <laughs> uh, here's the other thing they would say. It was in all the papers. Everybody would write and say, we all know Mrs. Polk is a master of herself, and we all suspect of someone else, too. <laughs> so uh, she was really quite something. So why didn't the ladies of Washington like her? There was a custom that uh, you were supposed to return a uh, social call. So if I went to see Rhonda, and we were society people back in 1840, uh, and if I was a woman, I would leave my calling card, like a business card with a fancy signature. I'd leave it with Rhonda. Then custom dictated that Rhonda had to return my call within, I think it was 72 hours. Um, and then Rhonda would come over to my place and we'd have a cup of tea or whatever, and she would return the call. Well, guess who never returned the calls? Mrs. Polk. Why didn't she return the calls? She was too busy lobbying Congress. <laughs> So the women felt snubbed and put off by her. Um, the other reason why the women of Washington didn't like her is this. It was so sexist back then that if, um, if, if the presiding um, man was not at, at, at the event, uh, a woman was not invited to come to the event. So, for example, if, of course, when Polk threw events, the president was always there. But... Um, uh, Mrs. Polk was then expected to throw her own social events just for the ladies, but she didn't do it because she was busy. And the women felt snubbed for this reason. After a White House dinner, the men would adjourn for cigars, bourbon, and political conversations. The women would go to, you know, the red, the blue, the yellow room for tea, scones, and talk of child rearing. I'll let you guess which room Mrs. Polk went to. <laughs> so the women felt snubbed because she's back there talking politics. Um, Congress even set out a chair in the gallery for her to go and sit because she was, uh, she was always following it. So Sarah Polk was a really interesting person, a real political dynamo. And what you find is because of sex role norms, um, Mrs. Polk didn't have any children. Therefore, women were almost solely defined through their role as a wife or as a mother. And because she didn't have any children, she basically made politics her pursuit. And back in the 18, you know, 20s, 30s, 40s, even 50s, Washington was such a cultural backwater 
and it was so difficult to get there. Uh, I just finished writing a book about George Washington building the capital city. And I came across, I mean, if I found one dozen, I found five dozen uh, letters from leaders who said they were through the woods into the wilderness and it was nothing but swamps and fields. So Washington DC was not the great city that it is today. So what used to happen was wives almost never made that trip to Washington. So Congress uh, and people in government, the men went by themselves. And this would be a long and harrowing ride in an open carriage or a wagon without GPS, <laughs> you know, unmarked, uh, you know, unpaved roads. Uh, so women simply didn't go to Washington. But Mrs. Polk always went to Washington. So she was an ever-present part of the city and a real political dynamo. So I decided I didn't want to write a book on Polk because I didn't really like him. And I started thinking, Mrs. Polk would make a nice book, but my publisher said nobody would ever buy a book about Mrs. Polk. So I put that on the back burner and I started thinking about another book. I wanted to write a book on Thomas Jefferson. Now, a couple of you, uh, I see uh, Willow and, and uh, Auntie Jane and Claire and Carolyn and Karen. So some of you know me and you know I never liked Thomas Jefferson. Uh, I'm a Hamilton guy, uh, even before the musical. <laughs> so I never liked Jefferson, but here's what I thought would make a good book. Jefferson was clearly brilliant, and he was a genius. And I thought the one thing about Jefferson that everybody knows is he wrote the Declaration of Independence. But here's the pickle. No one knows the story. So my book was going to be Jefferson spent 17 days in Philadelphia working on the Declaration uh, in a second story loft. So I figured maybe that would make a nice book. So I was going to write a book on the 17 days that Jefferson took to write the Declaration. What was he reading? What was he thinking about? What inspired the Declaration? The short answer is John Locke's second treatise on government, but beside that. Um, so uh, there are some people in senior positions in politics today that say Jefferson had the Bible open as inspiration. That's completely untrue. He had John Locke open the great British philosopher, uh, the man of enlightenment. So anyways, um, so I was going to write uh, that book. And what struck me was this, after Jefferson finishes the declaration, the first thing he does is he goes shopping. And he went and he bought his wife, Mrs. J, Martha Wales Skelton Jefferson. He buys her several pairs of gloves. It turns out that Mrs. Jefferson was the Imelda Marcos of gloves. <laughs> Y'all remember Imelda Marcos? So with shoes, um, anyways. Uh, and then Jefferson meets with the other founders and they're planning on a whole, you know, days and weeks of discussion. How do we reach out to the powers in Europe now that we're declaring ourselves independent? How do we fund this war? How do we fight this war? How do we win this war? How do, what do we do? Uh, and Jefferson figures to be, you know, a central person in that, those discussions. Jefferson begs out of them and goes home. Why? Mrs. J had miscarried the year before and was preggers and was not feeling well. So Jefferson goes back to see his wife. And then through correspondence, while he's taking care of his wife, uh, he's involved in all this from back at Monticello. So I think, my gosh, Mrs. Jefferson had a front row seat to history. Right, everyone? And then here's the kicker about Mrs. Jefferson. She would die uh, shortly thereafter, and therefore uh, she was never the first lady. Jefferson was a widower as, as president. And in fact, Mrs. Jefferson, Martha, was the only person married to a president that we don't know what she looked like. There is no known portrait, no known locket or miniature uh, of Mrs. Jefferson all of her letters, portrait. Jefferson burns everything after she died. She was so distraught that he destroys everything. What happened was when Jefferson and his wife, Martha, married, it was her second marriage. Her first husband, who wins my award for having the worst name in revolutionary America. His name was Bathurst Skelton. <laughs> oh. uh, he and their baby boy died. Uh, Martha moves back with her father, and that's when Jefferson came a courting. He and Martha married, 
uh, and it, they were married for 10 years. And in 10 years, she had six children. Now, remember, she lost the first child with her first husband. She has six kids with Jefferson. Uh, three of her six children die in infancy. So she lost four of, of her, her seven children. With each pregnancy, she gets weaker and weaker and weaker. And on her final pregnancy, uh, she dies from childbirth. Uh, and then the baby dies not long thereafter. So um, Jefferson was so distraught, he burns everything. And therefore, we don't know anything about her. She was said to have been beautiful, uh, talented. Uh, she could paint, you know, write, play the uh, harpsichord, and so forth and so on. Uh, but we don't know what she looked like. So here on the left, this is her oldest daughter, Martha Jefferson Randolph, uh, who was said to look a lot like her mother. So this gives us some sense. Um, and on the right, that silhouette, that cutout, uh, it, it's often said to be Mrs. Jefferson. We're not 100%, we historians, are not 100% sure, but my money is on that it's the daughter. Um, so, uh, so what I thought was, wow, that would, be, that would be a great book. Who was this Mrs. Jefferson? But again, I, there's not enough information to write a book on her. And my publisher said nobody would buy it. So I had my eureka moment. Instead of writing a book on Jefferson in, in Philadelphia, instead of writing a book on James K. Polk, thank goodness, <laughs> I decided to write a book on the first ladies. And that's why Rhonda contacted me. And that's why I'm here today and why you're listening. So the fingerprints of first ladies are all over American history, everyone, especially our founding mothers. So here's a few stories for you. So the first ladies, there's the National Botanical Garden on the top right in Washington, D.C., uh, which is named for the first ladies. Uh, there is an impressive group of six first ladies together on the lower left. Um, everybody's probably been to the Smithsonian Museum of National Museum of American History, uh, one of my favorite places to go. And you can see the first lady gowns there. You can see them, um, which is uh, remarkable. So why study the first ladies? Why listen to a speech about the first ladies? First off, virtually every president had a first lady with him. Uh, there were very few that did not. Andrew Jackson was a widower. Thomas Jefferson was a widower. Mar Martin Van Buren was a widower. And then we had a lifelong bachelor president in James Buchanan. But, you know, basically, <clears throat> other than that, we've had first ladies throughout our country's history. And as I wrote in a book, for what the, I mean, we've had a couple of really good presidents, uh, you know, Truman, Washington, Lincoln, FDR, Teddy Roosevelt. And we've had a lot of really, really bad presidents. We've had more bad presidents than we've had good presidents. Uh, we've had more below average presidents than above average presidents. I believe that for what the first ladies, and I put this in writing and I've said this at academic events for over two decades, I believe that for what the first ladies were charged with doing, that they in general better discharged their duties than the presidents did. We've had some really good first ladies. Think of your Martha Washingtons and Abigail Adamses and Dolly Madisons and Jackie Kennedys and Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, Roz Carter, Betty Ford, Lady Bird Johnson. We've had some great uh, first ladies. Melania Trump. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, we've had some really good first ladies and they have changed this country. So th that's one reason to do it. There's social projects. I've interviewed a couple of first ladies. I've interviewed uh, Lady Bird, Betty Ford, Roz Carter, Barbara Bush, Laura Bush. Um, and they hated the term pet project. They liked it called a social project or a social cause. Um, so here I listed a few recent ones. You can see that there's some very worthy issues there. Take Roz Carter, for example. Not only did she embrace mental health, but she was an honorary co-chair of her husband's mental health care task force that produced the 1980 Comprehensive Mental Care, Mental Health Care Reform Act. I mean, remarkable. Unfortunately, Reagan came in the next year and dismantled the whole thing, but it, she helped get it passed. Barbara Bush and Laura Bush were relentless in promoting libraries, right, Rhonda? And promoted uh, books, reading, and literacy. Uh, did a remarkable job. They helped organize book fairs around the country and literary programs. Um, uh, Lady Bird Johnson's beautification program. 
by the way, she told me she hated, I got to talk to her right before she passed, uh, Lady Bird Johnson, uh, big fan of hers, by the way, uh, Lady Bird said that she hated the term beautification. She wanted it called conservation. But this is the 60s, and it was viewed as that wasn't, that wasn't feminine enough, and it would be seen as, you know, too political for a first lady. But what she did is she was the one who promoted the cause which produced legislation so that we don't have unsightly billboards in national parks and scenic roads. Is anybody like me, do you just hate billboards? It's one of my pet peeves. I hate billboards. Um, I like to drive and look at beautiful areas. So she was the one who restricted the size of billboards. They have to be a certain number of feet off the road. And on scenic national highways, national parks, wildlife reserves, no billboards. Uh, so she pushed all that. She was also the one that got the uh, native wildflowers measures through. And if you're like me, you love on a road trip, each state you'll see along the side of the state, the generally boring interstate highways, the native wildflowers of the state growing all over in a no cut uh, zone. So uh, yeah, so some really, really remarkable families. Michelle Obama, I listed three of her pet projects. Oh my God, she was in charge of everything. Um, Jackie Kennedy, her White House uh, restoration was remarkable. She won a uh, the Emmy Award for her televised tour of the newly renovated uh, White House. Um, when Jackie came into office in 1961, she was mortified. Uh, the, even though I like Ike, the previous First Lady Mamie did not have very good taste. Everybody, do you remember what was Mamie's favorite color? Pink. She actually painted the upstairs of the White House, some of the rooms pink and put pink carpeting, pink furniture. <laughs> Jackie Kennedy came in and was just appalled at what she saw. Jackie renovated the White House, but it wasn't just a redecoration. It was a legitimate, bona fide historical restoration. She had over 40 art historians and people working with her. And she created a guide that all first families since then have had to follow. And that guide says, when you, you know, the second and third floor of the White House are where the first family lives. Reagan used to have the cute line, he said, I live above the family store. <laughs> so. If the second and third floor, that's yours as the first family, but you're still limited in the terms of design that you can use, it must be historically accurate. Now the first floor is the people's floor. Uh, and what Jackie did, Jackie was a Francophone and a Francophile, all things French. Actually studied at the Sorbonne in, in addition to George Washington University in Vassar. Um, Jackie, um, uh, all things French. So what happened was, uh, the White House had been burned on August 24th, 1814 by the British during the War of 1812. Um, uh, and when the White House was rebuilt, it was um, an Irishman and two Frenchmen who were hired to rebuild it. And um, um, the, uh, uh, the redesign that James Monroe and his wife Eliza Monroe put into the newly rebuilt White House was French. Eliza Monroe, was much like Jackie Kennedy. She was a first lady who was a Francophone and a Francophile, visited France, and she loved French design. So they gave it that empire look circa 1820. So anyway, when Jackie Kennedy was renovating the White House, she wanted to make the White House look like it did in 1820, which is fantastic. Um, I'm sure all of you would agree with me that these types of historic restorations are absolutely essential. And Jackie was relentless in tracking down artifacts and items. Here's a good story for you. It's, uh, it's more than PG rated, Rhonda, but I, I hope you're okay with it. So Jackie went around collecting all these artifacts. One of the things, for example, Martin Luther King wrote that one day he and John Kennedy are walking through the White House and Jackie comes running by, running. And, and King says that JFK says, you know, Jackie, Jackie, I want you to meet Dr. King. And she doesn't even say hi. She's like, I just found an historic, you know, chair or painting or something. And Dr. King said he just laughed as Jackie goes running by. Um, so here's the story. Arguably the greatest hostess in the history of the White House was Dolly Madison. Uh, people just love Dolly Madison. And Dolly's serving, her famous bowl that she served her punches out of, was in the hands of a private collector. Uh, apparently it was sold 
under Chester A. Arthur's administration. Some private collector had the bowl. So Jackie goes over to the man's house to try to get him to give her or sell her the bowl. Now, Jackie is attractive and she's Jackie Kennedy. She's not used to men saying no. So she puts on her, I always called it her babykin's voice. You know, Jackie had that breathy kind of, you know, hello, <laughs> little like a Barbie doll come to life voice. Uh, so Jackie puts on her babykin's voice and asks for the serving bowl. And the man says, no. Jackie tries and tries, and the man says, no, I'm not giving it up. It's mine. It's priceless. So what happened, Jackie is livid, and she wants Dolly Madison's bowl. It's got to be in the White House. So the man is traveling. He's out of the country. He has two young sons, you know, like 20s. Jackie goes to visit the sons at the house. She puts all the moves on. The sons give her the bowl. <laughs> so Jackie gets a replacement bowl and leaves it there for the man. It's something similar. She puts a note in it, F you, Jackie Kennedy. <laughs> so she gets the bowl. Anyway, so Jackie's renovation of the White House was extraordinary. It pains me deeply, deeply, deeply to say her magnificent uh, crab apple trees and garden at the White House was just dug up by the current first lady. And it looks like, a, uh, you know, an astroturf, uh, you know, putting green. At any rate, so um, Jackie's work was amazing. Um, why study the first ladies? They're celebrities. Uh, what magazine was Michelle Obama not on the cover of, <laughs> right? Everything. More people can name the first lady than can name the vice president. Um, let's see here. Um, first ladies have testified to Congress. Uh, there you see Roz Carter at the top. There you see Hillary Clinton, Eleanor Roosevelt did, uh, Laura Bush, uh, uh, Joan Mondale, second lady, Walter Mondale's wife. So first ladies have testified before Congress. They've headed important committees. So they've been legitimate political players. On the bottom left, here's one of them. A uh, story that I love. That's Betty Ford. The night uh, of the election in 1976, when Ford lost a nail biter to Jimmy Carter and he had to concede, Jerry Ford had lost his voice. He couldn't speak. Plus, truth be told, if you look at old photos and video clips, he was tearing up. He was so emotionally gone. He was in no position to give his concession speech. Betty Ford gave her husband's concession speech. I'm a big Betty Ford fan, by the way, so that was very cool. Um, in uh, 1940, when FDR was going for his unprecedented third term as president, remember in 19, well, 1952-53, the 22nd Amendment came into place, limiting the president to two terms, but they used to not have a term limit. The only president to serve more than two terms was FDR. When he was being uh, nominated for his unprecedented at the Democratic Convention, unprecedented third term. He didn't even go and accept his nomination. He was not well physically in World War II had started the year before in Poland. He sent Eleanor who accepted his nomination. Could you imagine? Unbelievable. Um, so um, first ladies have been campaigners. There's Eleanor on the top left accepting the nomination. Uh, Laura Bush was said to be a non-political and not really much of a activist. But Laura Bush was a very effective campaigner. Quite frankly, I think better than her husband. There's Michelle at the bottom left. Michelle Obama got standing O's wherever. She still remains perhaps the most popular political figure in the country. So first ladies have been popular campaigners. I remember in, um, what was it, 92, when um, Bush won, was going for a second term at the Republican convention. Nancy Reagan came in by uh, video link. She got a bigger applause than he did. Uh, so first ladies have been campaigners. First ladies have an office and a staff. I said Jackie had over 40 people working for her. All first ladies in modern times have had between a dozen and two dozen staffers. Republican first ladies have on the lower end about a dozen. Democratic first ladies, more activists, have about two dozen. In other words, the first lady has a staff and an office larger than most of the senior presidential advisors. How's that? Um, they have an office in the East Wing of the White House. They also have an office in the Eisenhower Old Executive Office Building. You know, proximity is power, right? First ladies have an office right down the hallway. Teddy Roosevelt's uh, wife, uh, Edith, 
uh, his second wife, his first wife had died. His wife, Edith, used to get her books and her, her knitting, and she would sit at his desk in the Oval and knit and, while he conducted business. So talk about proximity to power. <laughs> when Ike had a, a, what we think was a heart attack, um, it was Mamie who created a quiet room upstairs for him to paint. Ike was a good painter, by the way. And Mamie literally sat her chair at the entrance like a guard, like a pit bull, <laughs> like a sentry. She sat at the entrance and wouldn't give access to Ike. So first ladies have had a staff. There's Michelle on the top right with Joe Biden, uh, uh, having uh, dinner with some of the kids from the, the, the first lady staff. Uh, here's an interesting story. This is Eliza Monroe, who I mentioned earlier. History would know a lot about her because she was remarkable, but she had serious health problems when her husband was president. So unfortunately, she could do very, very little. At any rate, Eliza was the Francophone, Francophile, who had the White House redecorated with all things French. At any rate, she and her husband, James Monroe, before he was president, he was the U.S. minister. Today, we would say ambassador to France. Now, they were there during the French Revolution, which was absolute chaos. Literally, people were being beheaded, you know, by the hour. Uh, it, the French Revolution and the aftermath was a lot more chaotic and bloody than the American Revolution. So they're over there. And the great Frenchman, the Marquis de Lafayette, and I'll refrain from rapping if there's any Hamilton fans out there. Uh, Lafayette, uh, who was like a son to George Washington, like a brother to Alexander Hamilton, and Lafayette would end up naming his own son, George Washington Lafayette. He was imprisoned in the Bastille. He was scheduled, he and Madame Lafayette, scheduled to be guillotined. Eliza Monroe, as the wife of the American minister, goes through the bloody, chaotic, revolutionary, streets of Paris to the Bastille, pounds on the door, demands to see the Lafayettes, announces that she's the wife of the American minister, and she's not leaving until they are let go with her. And they let him go. She saved Lafayette's life and his wife's life. And imagine the courage she had uh, uh, to, to do that, right? Uh, this is Louisa Catherine Adams. This is John Quincy Adams's wife. She, until Melania, was the only first lady that was born overseas. She was born in England. One parent was British, one was American. She actually had family members who signed the declaration. Uh, but she was uh, raised in Europe. She was multilingual uh, and a remarkable woman. When her husband was minister ambassador in uh, Russia and Prussia, um, he was reassigned and sent to uh, England, uh, France first, then England. So he summons her. She has to take a carriage across Europe in the winter with a baby. And of course, revolution is breaking out across Europe. Fortunately, every country she went in, she would stick her head out the carriage and yell something patriotic in the local language uh, to save her life. So a remarkable woman. She was a playwright. She and John Quincy, even though I like John Quincy Adams, uh, he was a, a good man, a good uh, 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 patriot, but a, a bad husband. Um, she wrote a play about a poor wife who had this politician husband who didn't pay her any attention and was a lousy dad. <laughs> Wonder where she got her idea. Um, this is on the top, Letitia uh, Tyler, uh, John Tyler, as in Tippecanoe and Tyler too. He was William Henry Harrison, old Tippecanoe's vice president. Old Tippecanoe, William Henry Harrison, dies one month into his presidency. He gave the longest inaugural address in history. 8,441 words during the coldest day in inaugural history and caught pneumonia and died. <laughs> uh, I don't call him old Tippecanoe. I call him old natural selection. <laughs> so um, at any rate, this is his wife, Letitia, in the top there, Tyler. So Tyler comes into the White House after old Tippecanoe died. And Letitia is known as a, a, a like a shadow type of figure. Um, she never appears at any White House function. She had had at least one, we believe two strokes uh, before this. So she was described, uh, the wording at the time, as an invalid. Um, so poor Letitia was ill. She died in the White House. So she was the first first lady to actually die in the White House. Um, Caroline Harrison, Benjamin Harrison's wife would as well. Uh, then Tyler is grief stricken. 
misses her terribly. He's in a funk. So his aides try to get him out of the funk by doing the following. They, um, there's a, a new warship called the Princeton. It's the most advanced uh, ship of its time. It even has corkscrews uh, like ships today. It was designed by the Swede who would design the monitor in the Civil War, the ironclad. At any rate, so they put Tyler on that, this and they have a great party. They invite his cabinet, military brass, and the wealthiest Americans. They have a, a band, they have a seven course dinner, and they mount on the deck of the ship, the largest cannon in the US arsenal was called the Peacemaker. So what they wanna do is they wanna fire the cannon. So they ask President Tyler, who by the way, never picked a vice president. He served without a vice president. They ask him to come up on deck for the firing of the cannon. He won't come up. Why? He's finally happy. He's below decks flirting with that young girl down there at the bottom, a Julia. She's in her early 20s. He's old enough to be her grandfather. This is very South Florida, isn't it, Rhonda? <laughs> yeah. so, um, so he's down flirting with Julia. So they fire the peacemaker, but then they want to fire it a second time. They tell him to come up. He won't come up. He's now dancing with Julia rather than go up to fire it. So they fire it a second time. They're going to fire it a third time. They tell the president, you've got to come up. He sends Julia's father up. So now he can put the moves on Julia. They, the peacemaker blows up and kills several members of the administration and kills Julia's dad. When she goes up on the top deck and sees bits and pieces of what was her father, she faints. Tyler picks her up, orders the ship back to dock, carries her into the White House, uh, has her recuperate upstairs with him, and they get married in the White House. Quite a shocker. So uh, White House wedding. Um, our early first ladies really created the office, as we know. That's Martha Washington uh, on, the, on your left with her signature bonnet. Uh, Lady Washington was a partner. Lady Washington asked the women of, of, of the country to not buy British clothing, to sew their own. She would have sessions where she would sit and just sew and sew and make clothing for Americans and for the soldiers. Um, she served recipes from American women rather than European recipes. So she was a big patriot in that respect. And Martha was a partner for George. Every winter of the war, she traveled hundreds of miles, open carriage, unpaved roads, freezing cold through enemy territory, ditches, crossing creeks and streams to be with her husband during the war. And what did she do? She prayed with the soldiers. She mended uniforms. She held their hands as they died. The soldiers called her Lady Washington, and they dedicated several military units to her name. One was Lady Washington's Dragoon, so a remarkable woman. Um, uh, in the middle is Abigail Adams. Uh, Abigail is, <clears throat> I always call her the first feminist. Uh, she's one of my heroes from history. Um, Abigail's the one who told John, remember the ladies. Um, John Adams was brilliant. Uh, he considered himself the smartest of all the founders, <laughs> so he had an ego. Um, but get this, he considered Abigail to be his intellectual equal. He didn't even consider Jefferson and Madison. He considered Abigail to be his intellectual equal. Um, and when he was in Europe, uh, uh, there are all these great letters that he and Abigail, the Dear John letters, <laughs> the Adams family, that they would write back and forth. And he would say to Abigail, and fortunately for history, unfortunately for them, they spent much of their lives apart, but they were such prolific letter writers and they kept them. So we know we have a front row seat to history through their letters, which I've read. So here's what you find. John would write to Abigail and he would say, I just got a diplomatic pouch from Congress or from General Washington, always called him the general. He said, now you tell me what's really going on. He sought her counsel uh, over that of, of Congress. On the right, that's Dolly Madison with one of her turbans. She, one of her turbans was purple. <laughs> Talk about the South Beach, Miami over the top lady, right? Uh, she even put peacock plumes in her turban. She wore scandalously low cut dresses as she's showing us right now. She chewed snuff, wore way too much makeup, could drink with the guys. She was Mae West <laughs> before there was Mae West. Um, Dolly was something else, but Dolly was a great hostess, which I mentioned earlier. 
Dolly's parties were nicknamed the squeeze or the crush because so many people wanted to get into them. And what Dolly did in her parties, here's a good one for you, Rhonda. Um, she, it was always said that she had her finger on the pulse. What she do is Dolly understood that the social was the political and the political was the social. Congress didn't make up their minds on how they're gonna vote the day of the debate. They made up their mind over dinner and drinks the weekend before. So here's what she would do. She would sit members of Congress and ambassadors strategically at certain tables, sat them strategically, so that an ally would be with an enemy and so forth and so on. Then what she would do, they called them Queen Dolly's Court. She would get about a dozen beautiful teenaged debutantes from Washington, all of whom wore low cut dresses like her, and she would seat them strategically at certain tables. So men, you know, older men talk, older men do stupid things around young, attractive women. We've always known that. Can you imagine back then? Here's what she would do. She would tell these young girls, listen, you're sitting next to Senator so-and-so. I want you to find out how he's going to vote on my husband's bill. So you can imagine these young girls sitting at the table going, what's a vote? <laughs> and uh, Dolly's advice to them was this. She said, if you're not getting any information, I want you to bat your eyelashes, and then here's your go-to move, bend over. <laughs> this is in the 18 O's and 18 teens. So then after the parties, Dolly would meet with these young girls and have a debriefing. And, she, and they would tell her, here's how the ambassador's gonna, you know, is everybody's gonna vote. So Dolly kept her finger on the pulse. One of my favorite Dolly stories, and I'll move on because I'm way, running way behind, apologies. One of my favorite Dolly stories is um, a subject of a, a new book of mine I just finished. Um, when the British burned the White House, as I said earlier, August 24th, 1814, uh, <clears throat> um, Dolly refused to leave the White House. She stayed with the maid and then two men of, who were friends of hers came in a wagon. She refused to leave until she preserved the artifacts of the White House. She risked her life to preserve history. It's my kind of gal. <laughs> so, um, for example, the great Gilbert Stort portrait of George, George Washington, which hangs in the White House, you've all seen it. He's wearing black, sword at his side, and his one hand is forward. It's a massive portrait. Uh, this was bolted into the walls. They couldn't get it out of the wall. So she ordered the aides to hack it out and then carry the canvas out. And only then, when the canvas was put in a carriage, did she leave and then the British marched in and burned the building. So what Dolly was the hostess. So there's, these are the women that created the office. This is uh, Jane Appleton Means Pyrrhus. If anybody's heard of Franklin Pyrrhus, our 14th president from New Hampshire. Um, so this is the biggest tragedy. And, and, and I'll tell you the story and then I'll, I'll bring this to a quick close because I'm overdue. Um, I say it because the one, things, the one thing the first ladies have had to deal with, their husbands all sought the office. A lot of them did not. Their husbands were you know, single-minded seekers, relentless, ambitious seekers of the office. The first ladies were often reluctant. Could you imagine trying to raise children or a family in the White House? It's a fishbowl, everybody. All the eyes of the world are upon you. Um, and, and you have to deal with tragedy. You have to deal with everything and raising kids in, in the White House. So here's the biggest tragedy. Franklin Pierce and Jane were the definition of opposites attract, if you know any couples like that. Uh, she was dowdy, ultra-religious, uh, prayed all day, didn't like dancing or singing unless if it was in church. Franklin Pierce liked the cards, the booze, the ladies, politics. So he was what we would have called a dandy, and she was uh, a dud. Um, so why did they marry? How did they get together? Um, Pierce was ambitious but had nothing. Jane's father was rich and was the most politically powerful preacher in New England. Um, in marrying Jane, it put him on the political map and got him elected. So they had a bad marriage. They had three children, all of them sons. Two of the three die in infancy. And Jane blames Franklin for their deaths. Why? Because he's so sinful. And it's not just the cards, the booze, and the ladies. It's politics. So she tells her husband, God took our children because of your sin. He's going to take our only remaining child. And you see him here. That's little Benjamin with Jane. 
Um, and thus, if you leave your sinful life of politics, Franklin Pierce is going to be the president. And at the height of his power in Congress, he shocks Washington by retiring. His wife is getting to him. He's starting to believe this nonsense. He goes back to New Hampshire. Uh, New Hampshire, as we know, is beautiful, but pretty slow. Um, it's too slow for Pierce. Unbeknownst to Jane, he changes his mind, puts his hat in the ring for the presidency. Now, how could she not know this? I told you New Hampshire is pretty slow. <laughs> Here's what it is. Jane stays in the second floor of the house, never goes out of the house. She sits there. The only two people she sees, a maid who changes her you know, overnight bowl and brings her food and her preacher. She sits there and reads the Bible around the clock, holding locks of her dead son's hair. Um, so when she finds out that Pierce is one, she won't talk to him. She said, you know, God's going to take our lives. So Pierce boards the train with Jane and little Benjamin. They're heading to Boston for the Christmas holidays and into the inaugural. The train derails in a snowstorm. Only one person on board the train is killed, little Benjamin. His skull is crushed. Um, Jane loses it. Who wouldn't? She refuses to go to Washington. She goes back to New Hampshire. She tells Pierce, I told you, you killed our son. God took him from us because you were going back into politics and it's sinful. Pierce is in such a funk during his inaugural. Uh, he needs a woman to serve as the hostess because of sexism to plan the menu, the venue, the seating. So he asks the outgoing first lady, Abigail Fillmore, to do that. She stands in a long receiving line, bad weather, shakes hundreds of hands, people coughing on her, no masks back then. She gets sick and dies, the outgoing first lady. Jane Pierce says, that was supposed to be me. Finally, they come up with a plan to get Jane to come to Washington. She misses her children. Uh, Pierce has his secretary of war, Jefferson Davis, basically helping to run the country which is one of the reasons his presidency is so bad. Davis has a new young wife. Her name is um, um, Verina. And she can't handle hosting and raising a kid. So Pierce and Davis say to Jane, why don't you come down and raise uh, Davis's baby? You don't have to do any politicking. Davis's young wife wants to do all that. You can raise the baby. She finally agrees and comes to Washington and the baby dies. I mean, if I wrote this as a novel, and if Rhonda was my literary agent, she would say, take your foot off the gas, Robert. This is implausible, but it happened in real life. So remarkable. Mary Todd Lincoln is probably the most scandalous first lady. Uh, I'm out of time, so let me move forward. The youngest first lady here is, um, you're looking at her, that's Frances Folsom Cleveland, who was 21 when she became first lady. Jackie was 31. Uh, and by the way, she was the goddaughter of the president, which is really creepy. <laughs> um, so let me end with this. There's Martha. Uh, on the right, that's young Martha. Uh, I think we should show pictures of young Martha rather than pictures of Martha with the bonnet. She looks disinterested. She looks like Betty Crocker meets Mrs. Santa Claus meets a grumpy Bubby. Okay, that's what she looks like. Um, at any rate, but if we show, the young Martha is a different Martha. So I'll end it with this story. Here's your closer. Um, so George Washington, I think, is one of the greatest Americans. I'm a big Washington fan. I'm not a revisionist. Any other person was the leader of the Continental Army, we would have lost. However, had there not been a Martha, there never would have been a George. So George had the misfortune of being born to the second wife of his dad, Augustine. And Augustine, George's dad, never liked his second wife. They had a terrible marriage. Her name was Mary Ball. Um, she was whiny and complained. Do you remember George Costanza's mother from Seinfeld? <laughs> That's basically her. Um, so George, when his dad, Augustine, dies, George is just a boy. He leaves everything to the kids from his first marriage. George, his mother, and his siblings are destitute. They have to downgrade to a little farm. George is raising all the kids and farming. George Washington as a teenager is big, bad case of acne, awkward, but burning with ambition, no education. So he concocts a plan on how he's gonna achieve greatness. He wants to marry an older wealthy woman. So he would be huge in Boca today, wouldn't he Rhonda? Did you see him in Boca? <laughs> 
Oh my God, yes. forget about it, you know, uh, or South Beach. Um, so George is looking for those colonial cougars. I actually did a research project years ago. This is probably 25 with folks at Mount Vernon. I asked them, who did George date when he was younger? Because I knew he was ambitious and wanted to do this. And they all said, we don't know. We found out nobody had ever looked it up. So we looked it up. We found that George tried to court 10 women and he went 0 for 10. Poor George went 0 for 10. He, he, he wrote that he cried himself to sleep. He wrote lame roses are red, violets are blue poems, one of which ended with the line, my poor wounded heart, it's been shot through by Cupid's dart. Oh, George, gee wash. <laughs> uh, he wrote that he went to one house, uh, one of the largest homes in Tidewater aristocracy, knocks on the door to try to court the daughter. Um, the servant gets the father. The father looks at Washington with a broken down mule and holes in his pants. And the father says, quote unquote, my daughter is a star out of thy orbit. And he laughs in Washington's face and slams the door. Washington went home, I just upset. So that's George. So here's George now, he's in his mid twenties. He wanted to be a plantation owner, a British officer and a gentleman. He's a colonial aide, he's still single, no money, mixed record on the battlefield, mid twenties. He's had a, he has a meeting with the colonial governor, which was in uh, Virginia in Williamsburg. His name was Robert Dinwiddie. If anybody's been to Williamsburg, that lovely colonial mansion, the governor's house, that's where George was going. So for an ambitious young guy like George, mid twenties, he's gonna meet the governor. This is his moment. George is racing back. Uh, he's in the battlefield out in what is today, Western Pennsylvania near Pittsburgh. He's racing to, um, to Colonial uh, uh, Williamsburg. He stops to water his horse at a man's house. The man's name is Chamberlain. Um, and while he's watering his horse, Chamberlain says, why don't you stay for dinner? George says, no, I need to get to Williamsburg tonight. I have a meeting with the governor in the morning. Chamberlain says, that's a shame because joining me for dinner is none other than Martha Dandridge Custis the wealthiest widow in all of Virginia, who's older than George. When George heard that, he went, cha-ching. <laughs> George <laughs> changed his mind. Get this, stayed for dinner, stayed the night, stayed for breakfast. Was late getting to Williamsburg. Now, let me make this story better. George Washington was so punctual, he was darn near anal. You could set a clock by him. So for him to be late, uh, what did George say when he met Martha? What did Martha say when she met George? Their letters are lost. We believe, historians believe, that Martha burned them after George died. Uh, George dies on December 14, 1799. Martha lives two and a half years later. During that time, most of his letters disappear. So we think she burned them. At any rate, here's what we do know. Uh, George did write a letter that survives. He wrote it to a London merchant named Robert Carey. It was Martha's merchant. After meeting the governor, one of the first things George does is he visits Martha in one of her six mansions. Uh, with, this one was next to the governor's mansion, so you can imagine. Um, and he writes a letter to her London merchant requesting an engagement ring. George Washington moved with lightning speed. He moved faster than the Boca Brisket Brigade. Am I right, Claire? <laughs> And we know how the brisket brigade works and down in your neck of the woods, Rhonda, South Florida. So that's fast. Had George not married Martha, he would not be remembered today, but a Midland colonial aide. And marrying Martha put him on the political, social, and economic map. He was now one of the leading men. And the rest, as they say, is history. So I want to say thank you to everyone. And I also want to let you all know that this is something I never do. I lecture on cruises. I'm so sick of never going anywhere and dressing up like a NASA astronaut to go to Publix. Uh, <laughs> so the supermarket. So as soon as this virus is behind us, I have four cruises I'm lecturing on. Uh, Croatia, the Greek islands, we're going to Santorini, Mykonos, Dubrovnik, which is one of the most magical places on the planet, my opinion. We're doing in Alaska with Oceana. Uh, we, next December, a year from now, 
We're going to do the Southern Caribbean on Oceana, my favorite cruise line. And then we're planning a Jewish heritage themed cruise on the Danube River, uh, Vienna, uh, Prague, and Budapest. Uh, Prague and Vienna are two of my favorite cities. So uh, here's the contact information if anybody. That's uh, Santorini on the right. Uh, there's the Danube on the left. So, or you can just holler at me and uh, I'll stop the share screen and now have at me any questions you have. I think that was about six hours long, wasn't it, Rhonda? I think it it's went very fast. fast. <laughs> I think it's it, was, it was really good. Um, have at me, everyone. Yeah, we have some questions on the chat and, um, that I'll read to you. It was a fascinating presentation and that's what a lot of the people are saying. Um, one of the first questions is, what is your impression of our next first lady, Jill Biden? Good. I'm a big Jill Biden fan. I really like Jill. She was a professor. Uh, I mean, she's been a rock in Biden's life. We know about Biden's tragic story with the car wreck claiming his family members uh, and him trying to raise two boys, literally commuting on the train every day so he could get his boys out of bed and be home to help him with their homework. And that's not a politically imagined, that's not a Paul Bunyan story. That's factual. Um, when he asked Jill to marry him, she said no countless times. Jill wanted to make sure because she knew those boys, little boys could not have any more turbulence in their life. She helped raise those boys. Uh, they, they, they both, and of course we lost Bo. And I for years used to say, Bo Biden will be the next president. This guy was remarkable, far more impressive than his father. Uh, looked like a Kennedy had the political instincts of a Clinton, military hero, good God, um, uh, and an honest, honorable, good family man. Uh, Bo was quite something. But um, I, so I've always liked Jill for what she did. She's a, a strong woman, an independent woman uh, who uh, has, has been, a, you know, a, a great rock in that marriage. Michelle Obama really liked Jill Biden, which, uh, Jill, uh, which is if Michelle says she's good, that's good enough for this guy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, another comment from Diane Berman was that Tyler, President Tyler, has two living grandsons. I read about one of them recently. It's amazing. So here's a good one for you. You ready for this? I met one of Tyler's grandsons, and I met Calvin Coolidge's grandson. Oh. Excuse me. I met Calvin Coolidge's son. He had two sons. Can you imagine? This is how long lived they were. First off, Tyler had the most kids of any president, or I should say legitimate kids <laughs> of any president. He had 15 kids. So Tyler had his last kid when he was about 70. Um, and Julia was very, very young. So we're back to Miami Beach. Um, so, and then Tyler's youngest kid had kids very late in life. So he had a grandson alive not long ago. I'm not sure if he's still alive. I haven't checked up on it. But um, Calvin Coolidge had two sons, Cal Jr. and John. Um, Cal Jr. died in the White House. Uh, he got a bad blood blister playing tennis on the White House tennis courts, and it got infected and killed him. I mean, go figure. The, the youngest son uh, lived to be like 99 or something. And I, even though I never liked Calvin Coolidge, believe it or not, I was a chairman of the Coolidge Foundation board. Uh, I liked Grace Coolidge. His wife was very, really cool. Red Sox fan, loved nature, hiked. She was friends with Helen Keller. Uh, she learned sign language. Grace Coolidge was very cool. Calvin was a stick in the mud at best. But um, so uh, when I first became chair of the Coolidge Foundation, you know, 25, I don't remember, a long time ago, uh, it was, I think, the last year of Coolidge's son's life. So I did get the meeting, which I just thought it was the weirdest thing that you're meeting John Tyler from the 1840s yes. and, and Calvin Coolidge from the 1920s. Yeah. Crazy, right? Yeah, um, I, oh, we are recording this presentation, That's Dr. Right. Watson. Is it okay if we put it on our website? Sure. Sure. Okay, great. Let me go through a couple. Everybody's saying how wonderful presentation is. Um, let's see here. Oh, what's the name of your book on this subject? Also, are you willing to name your three best books you would recommend to us? <laughs> That's like, which of your seven kids are the three best? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I'd recommend to you, uh, uh, it's, one's called The Nazi Titanic, um, which I think was one of my better selling books. Um, it's an unknown story of the Holocaust. 
it, the rest of my career, I will never, ever, ever find information like this. Uh, it, it was like, I liken it to being a paleontologist who puts a shovel in the ground to dig a garden and finds a new dinosaur. I found an unknown story from the end of the Holocaust by dumb luck. I'd like to lie to you and tell you it was br brilliant historical research, but it was dumb luck. Um, so it's called the Nazi Titanic. It's a crazy story about the end of World War II and the Holocaust. Uh, the one Rhonda mentioned, I'm very, very proud of uh, the ghost ship of Brooklyn. I'm a big revolutionary war buff uh, about that. And I have a book coming out in just a few months. It's called George Washington's Final Battle. And I'm really, really excited about it. It's with Georgetown University Press. And uh, they were going to release it in the spring and it got nominated for a bunch of awards. And then they put it on ice because of COVID because all the bookstores are closed, the book festivals were canceled, the awards were canceled. So they're gonna release it uh, in uh, about four months, I think. Um, so those are the three that I, I guess, if one has to name, and both my kids are my favorite kids. Um, so what other questions do you have there for okay. me? Okay, do you think Pete Buttigieg has a chance at the White House and how do you think his husband would fit into this conversation yes. of first partners? Yeah, uh, yeah, I do. I mean, Mayor Pete, I uh, really electrified audiences, uh, shocked a lot of folks. Um, it's almost certain that he'll be offered a position in, in Biden's cabinet should Biden win. You know, Buttigieg, Stacey Abrams, Beto O'Rourke, uh, Julian Castro, there's a couple really dynamic young politicians who are not presently in office. So everybody's saying there'll be no brainers for senior positions in a Biden administration if he gets it. Mayor Pete is charismatic, smart, guy speaks seven languages, could be a concert pianist, served in the military. Uh, now, uh, is America ready to elect a gay president? At present, absolutely not. Uh, but in a few years, who knows? Uh, if we had this conversation about electing a black uh, president uh, uh, several years ago, we would have said no way. If, if I would have told you 25 years ago that Biden's vice presidential nominee would have a father from Jamaica, a mother from India, uh, raised in Canada, a family of immigrants, people would say no way. America's changing, um, at least 50 some percent of it is, but remember you only need so many electoral states uh, in the electoral college. Uh, I think it's undeniable that as a professor, uh, I've been around young people for 30 years now as a professor for three decades. And what I can tell you is our, these kids from 18 to, you know, I don't know, 30, they just aren't hung up on the old taboos of race. Uh, they're not anti-Semitic, they're not homophobic, they're not sexist, they're, they're, they're remarkably enlightened. Um, and I think as they get older, it's, it's inevitable that we will break all these barriers and that you'll see a lot more diversity. You know, today we have 25 women in the Senate. That, that's not close to 50%, but it's a record. We have 102 women in the House, which is a record. We have nine female governors, which is a record. Uh, so we're making progress. Uh, we've seen open, and, and here's the thing about Mayor Pete, he ran as an openly gay candidate, uh, which is remarkable. What would we call this husband? First gent, first man, first dude, uh, who knows? But here's what I can say. If you look around the world, where there have been women elected to these positions. The US is trailing the world. We're number one. Um, uh, here's what you find. When you have a female leader, her husband is not expected to host teas, scones, and decorate the white the building. When you have a female governor, the husband golfs and holds his job. He's not expected to do this. So I think as soon as we get a woman president, all the customs and traditions of a first lady will go. And we'll just be back to having a, a confidant and a partner uh, as we've had since Martha and George. So, yeah. Well, hopefully we'll have that opportunity with the vice president coming up. Similar situation. Um, know, I, go ahead. I, my whole life I thought about, am I going to live to see a woman president, a black president, a Latino president, a Jewish president, a gay president? My whole life I thought about it because, you know, it's what I do for a living. And I wrote a book on this. And, you know, I'm, I was terribly excited, whether you like him or not, I was terribly excited, I happen to like Obama, that Obama was president. I, whether you like or don't like Kamala Harris, it, I think it's in, in, incredibly exciting. We had six women run for president in 2020. Six. Uh, 
and with Mayor Pete, you know, we had a, a Latino candidate, uh, a Jewish candidate. I mean, this is remarkable uh, in Castro and, and Bloomberg. So I do think I'm going to live to see all this stuff happen. Um, I do think I will. And I'm, so I'm excited about that. Oh, good. Well, I know we're getting close to the end. I just wanted to remind everybody that next week, September 23rd, Stories of Presidential Love and Scandal, and then September 30th, 100 Years of Women in Politics. And I, if you don't mind, I'll ask one more question. Do you think Melania Trump has been treated fairly as a first lady? Yeah, I think they've been treating her with kid gloves. No question about it. Um, she did something that no other first lady has done. She stayed home for months. Now, she had Baron in a school, yes, but many other first ladies had young children and they moved to the White House. Uh, Melania, much like Bess Truman, uh, the wife of my favorite president, much like uh, uh, Mamie Eisenhower, had, uh, Melania has done the least bit necessary. Could you imagine if um, Michelle Obama wore a jacket that said, I really don't care? Could you imagine if, um, if Hillary had torn up an historic part of the White House? People would have, her husbands would have been impeached. Um, Melania has been treated fairly with kid gloves. She's gotten away with things that no other first lady has gotten away with. Uh, people would have went ballistic. The same people that said Obama was born overseas have not said a peep about Melania being born overseas. Please don't misconstrue. I'm an internationalist. My wife is, is international. Uh, my children are bicultural. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm very progressive in, in these kind of things. I don't care where someone's from. Uh, but the same people that ranted and raved about Obama didn't say anything. If Obama's wife was born overseas, forget about it. Um, so um, Melania, I think, has done the bare minimum necessary. Um, she's the only first lady in memory that has not been a regular visitor of our wounded soldiers, has not been at Walter Reed, has not been at Dover when the caskets come back to comfort the families. Uh, she hasn't been at very many scenes of natural disasters and God knows we've had our share. She's doing the absolute minimum necessary. You know, I interviewed um, Roz Carter many years ago and she said something that stuck with me. She said, you know, I wasn't excited. I was apprehensive about becoming first lady, but I soon realized that this office allowed me to do a lot of good. And she said, I felt like I had the eyes of Martha Washington and Eleanor Roosevelt on me, and I had to do a lot of good. And I think all first ladies of both political parties, Mamie and Bess, an exception, except Melania, have really done a lot of good with this office. Her be best, and I, I'm try, not trying to offend anyone, I said a moment ago, I'm a gigantic Betty Ford fan. Uh, I had the great honor of being selected to speak at a 100th anniversary program in Betty Ford's honor uh, by Susan and Steve, her, the Ford children. So I'm a big Betty Ford fan. Uh, uh, I think she was courageous like Harry Truman. I'll remind me, I'll talk about that next week or the following week. But, um, so it's not a partisan shot, but um, Melania's be best, first off, it's grammatically incorrect. <laughs> her be best campaign, <laughs> Uh, she's done virtually nothing with it. Uh, other first lady, Lady Bird Johnson, Betty Ford, these people were, were tireless in their advocacy. You couldn't keep some of them out of, of forts and out of soldiers deployed overseas. They, they were just tireless about it. So I think she's been treated too fairly, quite frankly. Okay. Um, yeah. And, 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 and I, I apologize for going on and on. I, didn't, I wanted to show it wasn't a mean political shot. I wanted to make my point uh, in that. I wish she would do more. So, uh, but I am glad the press has left her alone and I'm glad the press has left uh, her son alone yes. um, as they should. Uh, I wish they would have left, they left the Bush kids largely alone. I think they gave Amy Carter a bad time. And I think they largely left the Obama kids alone but from time to time got on their case. I think the first family should be off limits, so. Thanks, everyone. Okay, well, thank you so much. Thanks, we'll see you next week. Really enjoyed it. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you.
Hi there.